डॉक्टर शशि थरूर साहब थैंक यू वेरी मच स्पीकर ऑन एटीन डिसम्बर नाइनटीन नाइन्टी थ्री वेन दिस पार्लियामेंट दिस लोकसभा फर्स्ट डिबेट इन अडॉप्ट द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट्स बिल फॉर द फर्स्ट स्पीकर इन सपोर्ट ऑफ द लेजिस्लेशन वॉज माई डिस्टिंग्विश प्रीडिसेसर एज मेंबर ऑफ पार्लियामेंट फॉर फिर ऑफ द फोरम मिस ए चार्ल्स दी ओनली अदर पर्सन apart from myself who has won three elections to this house from that seat uh so as a successor a few times removed sir i am very proud to stand here to defend the spirit of the national and states human rights commission so in november 2016 the report of the united nations subcommittee on accreditation or the sca had raised several serious concerns about the manner of functioning of our national human rights commission and the un therefore deferred the process of accreditation for india on the ground that we were not fully complying with the paris principles as adopted by the un general assembly in 1963 i beg your pardon 1993 to minimize the international embarrassment the center central government promised to reform the nrhc uh, the national human rights commission and based on this assurance we were recredited as a in 2017 This is why the government has brought the bill to parliament. So the entire logic of this bill is to fulfill the assurance given to the international community that we will strengthen our human rights commission reform it in a way that matches the requirements of the Paris principles. Now as lawmakers sir we have to be concerned about whether the bill does what it is intending to do or what it is supposed to be intending to do. Does the bill live up to the Paris principles? and does it truly strengthen the human rights commissions in defending our citizens fundamental rights sir, as enshrined in our constitution and i'm afraid this bill fails on both counts for six specific reasons that i would like to place before this house the first and most important sir is lack of autonomy the fact is that the most essential feature of the paris principles is having an autonomous and independent human rights commission in a country none other than our own supreme court has observed that the national human rights commission is a toothless tiger as the government ignores its recommendations and directions so as of march 2017 there were 32085 cases pending with the commission 29548 were pending either for want of reports from the authorities concerned or the reports received being pending for consideration by the commission now the authorities are not reporting to the commission sir the commission itself had acknowledged and it had requested the government to vest it with powers of contempt to punish civil servants who do not follow the commission's directions especially those who fail to submit independent reports on time the bill completely ignores this recommendation This is what the Human Rights Commission itself has asked our government to do our government has ignored it. Now the Secretary General of the National Human Rights Commission is a member of the government and the investigation teams consist of policemen from various state governments. The SCA had encouraged the government to open up the post of Secretary General to persons who may not be civil servants. For example lawyers with human rights background to diversify investigating teams by including persons who are not part of the police force. but none of these suggestions has been addressed by this bill it would have been very easy to do it the un would have been very happy because it would show that we are doing the best international practice we have not bothered to do that this is just merely more bureaucrats more uh, police more government control second objection sir out of six is a reduction of tenure the bill reduces the tenure of chairpersons and members from 5 years to 3 years without providing any explanation or reasons for doing so reducing the tenure and the subsequent increase in the frequency of the change of members and staff can lead to inconsistency sir in the functioning of the human rights commission and it will also impact any long term investigation undertaken by it because a long term investigation can often take more than 3 years number 3 sir re eligibility to hold office the bill currently allows the chairperson of the human rights commission and the state human rights commission commissions to be eligible for reappointment after their term 
Therefore, it is possible very much to foresee a situation where certain members may turn pliable to the government in the hope of reappointment. So the normal practice around the world is to have longer terms but fixed one term so that no one has any desire to satisfy the government in order to be reappointed. The independence of the National Human Rights Commission must be taken seriously and especially after this government had tried to appoint the vice, one of the vice presidents of the ruling party as a member of the National Human Rights Commission and finally civil society groups made such an agitation and went to the Supreme Court against this, then he withdrew his own nomination. We need to expressly bar politicians from becoming members of the Human Rights Commission and that certainly this bill does not do. Number four, so vacancies. The National Human Rights Commissions and the State Human Rights Commissions have been plagued by positions which are left vacant for an unreasonable period of time. The post of the chairperson of the National Human Rights Commission was left vacant for almost eight months, sir. similar to how the we could not possibly, probably discuss the RTI properly, but the uh, Information Commission is also being kept vacant in the same way. The office of the Lokpal was kept vacant for almost five years. The fact is that the post of DG Investigations of the National Human Rights Commission was kept vacant for a period of three years since 2014 until the Supreme Court hauled up the government for its failure to make an appointment. The bill should have provided for time-bound appointments, but it does not do so. Thus, a hostile government can cripple the Constitution, letting posts lie vacant for a long time, just as the RTI Act has been hollowed out by simply not appointing commissioners and allowing cases to pend. Similarly, the same problem with the Human Rights Commission. Number five says a, a removal of the statutory bar. See, in order to strengthen its functioning, the National Human Rights Commission had recommended amending Section 36.2 of the Act because it bars the Commission from taking cognizance of a human rights violation beyond one year from the date of the incident. So the point is that, I need just five minutes, sir. The problem is the bill has completely ignored this recommendation. So the problem is the Commission cannot take care of a violation which for various good reasons may not have been reported to it during the one year period provided in the bill. And finally, sir, the failure to provide clarity to the Human Rights Commission. Section 30 of the Act empowers the government to set up human rights courts in each district to handle cases of human rights violations. But the Act is completely unclear, sir, about the exact nature of jurisdiction of such courts, due to which very few human rights commissions have been set up, thereby increasing, uh, sorry, human rights courts have been set up, thereby increasing the number of complaints before the Human Rights Commission. In 2016, the Human Rights Commission had recommended that the Act be amended to clarify this issue about the courts. But this has also been ignored by the bill. So I regret to state, sir, that this bill is piecemeal and cosmetic. It doesn't even scratch the surface of the problem that led to us being denied our accreditation. The Minister must withdraw it, sir. Bring in the additional provisions to address the specific gaps I've listed. This bill could have been a golden opportunity to reform the Human Rights Commissions and the State Human Rights Commissions also, but it's turned out instead to be a damp squib. More worrying, sir, when the United Nations Subcommittee looks at all of this, there is a real fear we will face an international embarrassment. I want to say to the government that we've had a situation where a special monitor of the National Human Rights Commission, my old friend uh, Sri Harsh Mandar, had visited Assam and prepared reports which revealed large-scale human rights violations in the detention centers that house people deemed to be foreigners. It is said that two of these official reports were forwarded to the center, and one independent report he prepared has been released to the public. But these reports were ignored by the government. He's now resigned in protest. Now, sir, I have received a list of, a confirmed list, sir, of 57 people, 57 people in Assam who have committed suicide, sir, because the NRC has excluded them. Ironically, sir, a majority of these people are Hindus and they have committed suicide. And I want to say to this government, are they conscious of the fundamental uh, concerns relating to the non-inclusion of the, of the uh, citizens of India in the NRC list? Many cannot prove. Even there are ministers who cannot prove their birth date or their uh, college degrees. How can you say that people should be excluded from the basic rights of this country because they cannot prove their, their, their birth date. 
it seems to me, sir, that, um, that these are people who seem to believe that for their lifetime they've had a right to remain in India, and it's a flagrant abuse of, of human rights. I want to ask the Minister, if you're not going to take any action on the basis of human rights reports, special reports of this nature, then ultimately, sir, what is the purpose of claiming you're reforming the Human Rights Commission? I'll conclude in a minute, sir. I just wanted to say that it's ironic that we are speaking about strengthening the Protection of Human Rights Act just days after the International Commission of Jurists condemned the attempt of this government to stifle the voices of two of the most famous, well-known, internationally recognized human rights defenders in our country, two senior advocates, Indira Jaising and Anand Grover, who've been in the forefront of defending the rights of pavement dwellers, cancer patients, women, sexual minorities, and other vulnerable sections of society. At a time when the Harvard Law School was honoring the human rights lawyer Sudha Bhardwaj for her work, our government was busy arresting her and other activists. While this government did nothing, sir, to stop willful defaulters from fleeing the country, they were desperate to offload an environmental activist from a plane only to be wrapped by the Delhi High Court for doing so. The list goes on and on, sir. I will not elaborate, but you know that there are many more examples, sir. This is a dark time for human rights in our country in many ways. I urge our human rights defenders to continue fighting as the conscience keepers of our nation. I urge the government to ensure that the international standards you need to reach in conformity with the Paris Principles and the spirit of the Paris Principles should be reflected in the bill that you bring. I suggest you take it back. Please look at the points I've raised, all of which will help you to get this bill accepted by the international community and then come back to this House and we will look at it in a sympathetic spirit because we believe in human rights on this side of the House, sir. As far as we are concerned, we will overcome one day. Until then, we have to keep the fight alive, the flame alive for human rights in this country. Don't try and extinguish the flames, gentlemen on the other side. Thank you very much. On